The Woodman's Enigma by Gary Kilworth They played a game called Enigmas. I've got one, said Colin. Romeo and Juliet are lying dead on the floor in a pool of liquid. They're surrounded by broken glass. What's happened? His ten-year-old sister Jill snorted. Oh, Colin, that's an old one. Romeo and Juliet are goldfish. The liquid is water and the bits of glass are their smashed goldfish bowl. She flicked her blonde ponytail. Think of a new one. Colin, fair-haired and tall for thirteen years of age, sighed and stared out of the train window at the falling snow. I can't, he said. I've run out of ideas. We really need the computer for a good enigma. I don't expect Uncle Giles will have one. He's sixty-something. It was dark when the train at last pulled into Rochford Station, and so quiet they could hear themselves walking along the deserted platform, even though their footsteps were deadened by the snow. Christmas was only seven days away, and here they were in a strange country place with no real celebration to look forward to. Both of them felt pretty miserable, but they knew they'd have to make the best of a bad job. A taxi arrived. Giles Foster's place, said the driver, expecting him to meet you. Yes, we were, said Jill, but our Uncle Giles must have got the times of the trains wrong. The taxi driver frowned. That doesn't sound like Giles Foster to me. Colin shrugged. Anyone can make a mistake, I suppose, he said. We've never actually met Uncle Giles, not so as we can remember. Our mum's sick in hospital. She's got to have an operation. So she wrote to Uncle Giles, and he said he'd have us for Christmas. What about your dad? asked the driver. Dad's not with us, answered Colin, not wanting to go on. The car suddenly pulled off the main road and went jolting along a mud track. It pulled up outside a wooden shiplap cottage. Once the car lights had gone, the place looked very gloomy and forbidding. There was an ice-cold lion's head knocker on the door. Colin hammered with this for at least a minute, but no one answered. Jill found the doormat under the snow and lifted it. Underneath was the key. Hello, Uncle Giles, they called, pushing open the door. No answer. Jill tried the light switch, but nothing happened. Even if Uncle has got a home computer, it won't work without electricity. We're going to have to forget our plan. The plan was that they invent a new video game in order to make themselves enough money to get their father home. Dad was in Saudi Arabia working for a petroleum company. He'd been unable to find work in England. The plan was not really a pipe dream. A sixteen-year-old friend of theirs had set up a workshop in his garage, and if Jill and Colin could come up with a really good game, they could make a fortune between them. That fire's going to go out if we don't get more logs, said Colin. You stay here. No way, said Jill. I'm not staying in this spooky place on my own. Most of the trees in the spinney were blackthorns, too skinny to be of any use on the fire. Then they came to a massive evergreen tree. The snow had been too heavy for one old dead branch. It had snapped away under the strain and fallen to the earth. There was an instant flare as they put the two halves of the branch on the fire. It helped to brighten the room. The only trouble was that the logs tended to crackle and spit. His thoughts were interrupted by a sharp rat-a-tat on the front door. Then a voice cried, Let me in. I know you're in there, the pair of you. Who are you? cried Jill, her voice wavering. Giles Foster! Colin let out a breath of relief. Uncle Giles, he said, and unbolted the door. Giles Foster sat down in the old armchair by the fire. You, uh, <clears throat> you had no bad encounters, I trust. Encounters, asked Jill. Yes, with the ghost. What ghost, asked Colin. Giles was looking intently at the hissing logs. He haunts the spinney mostly, but he sometimes comes in here 
a looking. The logs on the fire spat a shower of sparks into the fireplace. Them logs, where did they come from? From the big tree, Uncle. The old yew tree. Oh, no wonder. Mm, you'll meet the ghost this night. That much is certain. Both children glanced nervously towards the front door. But then, you don't believe in ghosts, do you? Giles leaned forward and stirred the logs with a poker. Yes, it was at the turn of the last century. There was this woodman, you see, fine figure of a man, thought it time to lay aside his axe and go courting, settle a bit. He'd been a coppicing and a cutting down trees all his life. Near destroy the forest he did. Some say the old yew tree killed him of a purpose while he were on his way to a carol service just a few days before Christmas. Somebody walked under the old yew tree, caught a clip on his ear from a dangling boot, and there he was, hanging by his neck from a fork in a branch. Well, there were no going straight to heaven, of course because the woodman was not in particular a religious man. The way of his death were very mysterious, and until someone living guesses exactly how the woodman met his death, his spirit is not to be put to rest. And no one has guessed it, said Jill. That's terrible. Come on, Colin. We can think of how he died the way we play enigmas. I have to warn you, said Giles, that if you fail to get the right answer, there's a penalty. What? asked Colin, his skin tingling with fright. The woodman's ghost will return night after night and harass you until you're half out of your mind with fear. Scared as they were, the children felt compelled to go on. Jill swallowed hard. Did the wind sweep the branch down low and scoop him up? Mm, doubtful, said Giles. Did the woodman climb the tree? asked Colin. And he slipped, cried Jill. Possible, said Giles, but why did he climb the tree in the first place? Hmm? There was a kite caught in the branches, said Jill, and the woodman wanted to take it home to his grandchildren. Wrong again. The woodman were a bachelor. An old bachelor, said Colin. Mm, growing on, you might say. Then he wouldn't have a girlfriend, would he? So he wasn't climbing up to break off a few small branches to make some sort of a bouquet or something. Why wouldn't he have a lady friend? He may very well have had a lady for whom he carried an affection. So, this girlfriend, said Jill carefully, she was at church, wasn't she? Otherwise he wouldn't be going there. You said he wasn't very religious. Giles clasped his hands together, and for the first time his eyes showed approval. Good lass, good lass. So, said Colin, frowning, he was on his way to church to see his girlfriend, though they were both quite old. Did she like him much? asked Jill. Ah. There's the tragedy. No, not a great deal. He once tried to kiss her, and she gave him short shrift. Colin remembered trying to do the same thing to a girl at a birthday party. You need an excuse for that sort of thing when they don't want you to do it. Jill suddenly sat up straight and clicked her fingers. Got it, she cried. Mistletoe. He was climbing the tree to get some mistletoe so that he could have an excuse to kiss the spinster, and he slipped and fell and got caught in the fork of the branch. At last, at long last, the woodman's ghost be able to close his eyes and go to his rest. He pointed a bony finger at the door, and the children immediately guessed that the ghost was coming. The door swung open, and an old man stood before them, his eyes 
were colder than winter. "'I believe in ghosts,' whispered Colin. "'I really do. "'I can tell you how you died. "'You'll be free. "'You can stop roaming the spinney.' "'What on earth are you talking about, young man?' said the ghost, kicking off his shoes. "'Colin and Jill, eh?' "'Please, Woodman,' began Colin, but the ghost interrupted him with, "'Woodman, I'm your Uncle Giles. "'The car broke down on the way to the station. "'I've been walking for an hour over the fields. "'Sorry I wasn't there to meet you. "'Taxi brought you, eh? "'Why on earth are you sitting in the dark, for goodness sake?' "'He reached up and turned a switch. "'The room was suddenly bright.' And when Colin and Jill turned to look at the chair by the fire, it was quite empty. The ghost of the woodman had played his final trick on the living and had gone now to the place where he belonged, in the land of the dead. Now, said Uncle Giles, what about this Woodstock chappy? Oh, what? Never put a yew log on an open fire, it spits. "'Brings the ghost, too. "'But I don't want to frighten you. "'We'll damp down the fire, and perhaps he won't come.' "'He's already been,' said Jill. "'Good Lord! "'Giles Foster, your great-great-uncle Giles, as a matter of fact. "'Here was he. "'Well, I'm blowed. "'He, um... "'He didn't, by any chance, ask you to solve any riddles, did he?' He did, and we gave him the right answer, said Jill proudly. And they told him the story of the mistletoe and how it happened. Now, come into the den. Bought something special for the pair of you. Make Christmas with an old man a bit more exciting. He led them into another room, switching on the lights as he did so. Ta-da! he cried, gesturing towards the desk. On it was a brand new home computer. That night, when the house was silent, Colin and Jill stared out into the starlit landscape. "'I bet I know what you're thinking,' said Jill. "'What?' asked Colin. "'We've got our video game, the one that'll make enough money to get Dad back home.' Colin thought. Suddenly it came to him. "'You mean the game called The Woodman's Enigma?' "'That's the one,' said Jill. The Woodman's Enigma was written by Gary Kilworth and read by me, Edward de Souza. The story was abridged for radio by Penny Lester and the producer was Nandita Ghosh.